This special monthly UBU episode on hashtag Black Mental Health is sponsored by Janta Neuroscience and supported by the Painted Brain, a California peer-run organization. Okay, okay. It is another episode of Unapologetically Black Unicorns with hashtag Black Mental Health. And I am so honored, fortunate, and excited to have conversation today with Mr. Ellis Gordon Jr. And why are we having this conversation? Because July is B.B. Moore Campbell National Minority Mental Health Awareness Month. And with that, I'm going to let Ellis talk a little bit about why he has a special connection to this month. So why don't you introduce yourself first? Well, thank you, Karis. It's an honor to be on this uh, podcast with you. Again, my name is Ellis Gordon Jr. I'm the former husband of the late B.B. Moore Campbell and the executor of her estate. I'm also the treasurer of uh, NAMI Urban Los Angeles, which was a chapter that was started by B.B. As a matter of fact, not only did we serve the Black community, we served the Hispanic community and, and the Korean community. So I'm treasurer of, of that organization, of that affiliate, and, and I'm glad to be with you today. Charles. Wonderful. Yeah, it's so nice to see you. We haven't seen each other in person for quite some time. And I um, used to be a member of NAMI Urban LA, and I love that we called it NULA. It sounded so like culturally... <laughs> you know, like aligned to to uh, the work that um, NAMI Urban LA does. So um, you say you're the husband of um, B.B. Moore Campbell. So can you tell us a little bit about her? I have my own personal story, but you you have stories, right? So, right. but why, like, why is there a whole month named after her? And that isn't just like, oh, let's name the month after B.B. Moore Campbell. It was like an act of uh, the House of Representatives at the federal level. So tell us a little bit about her uh, her story and your story as well. Well, Bibi and I were uh, met on a blind date in 1983 when her best friend, uh, Francine Greer, was uh, pregnant with her first child. Uh, So she came and as the story goes, she had asked Francine to line her up with several dates because she was going to be in town for a week, so she had a date for every night. So Francine had lined up a date for every night. I was the third date after we met and we went to lunch and I told her, so you can tear up the list. And she just started laughing. She said, what are you talking about? I said, well, I know a woman as fine as you, there must be a list. So <laughs> I, I, and so that's how we started. We started there and then we got married the next year. And one of our family members had uh, a mental illness that we were not aware of. And before that, we weren't aware of what you know mental illness was. It didn't affect us. We had no no reason to that, to be involved with it, but but after we found out that our loved one was uh, diagnosed as, as as having bipolar disorder, uh, and she was also uh, abusing uh, drugs and also had a borderline personality disorder, so it, it became it kind of came up on us all at once. We didn't know where to go. Uh, Bibi had been reading some materials and she had heard about the. Uh, the National Alliance for Mental Illness, and she found that there was a chapter on the west side of Los Angeles. So she went to the meetings, became quite enthralled in what NAMI does, and became a, a trainer. And once she got there, she said, you know, this is something that needs to be in our community. Rather than sending people over to the west side to get training, she said, we need to start a, an affiliate on our side of town. So she got together with five other Black women. And you know what happens when Black women get together. Oh, yeah. You know, but they decided that they wanted to start an affiliate of uh, NAMI in the hood. So that began, uh, started as, as NAMI Inglewood. It morphed into uh, NAMI Urban Los Angeles because we were reaching out to all of uh, Southern California, to tell you the truth, but, but primarily Los Angeles counties and counties around it. So that's how we got started. BB had, uh, she wrote two books that dealt with, with mental illness. One was a, a children's book to help uh, young children to cope with their parents. And that was entitled, Sometimes My Mommy Gets Angry. And it just was kind of a, a, a uh, just a pro forma for young children to follow if they had a loved one that was had a mental illness. The other uh, book she wrote, which became a a bestseller was 72 hour hold. 
And as most people are aware, in, in Los Angeles and in California, it's called the 5150, where what happens is that if your loved one is exhibiting behaviors that may be harmful to themselves or to others, then they can be picked up and placed on what's called a 72-hour hold so they can evaluate them to see what damage they may do to themselves or to others. And also after that, you know, the next step would be would be like a 14-day hold so that that could be utilized to, to get the person medication or counseling because there's a combination. Not only do you need the medication, but you also need psychotherapy. They kind of work hand in glove. And it's not just, well, you can take the medication, you'll be fine tomorrow. No, that's not going to happen. You have to actually go through psychotherapy and you have to be serious about doing that. So that's how she got involved with that. And having a national platform, because she was a well-known author at the time, that's how she brought more notoriety to NAMI itself, or the national organization, and became like a not only a national spokesperson, but an international spokesperson, because when we did book signings in, in Europe, we would also make them aware of the different problems that would be you know, experienced. And of course, this is not, our mental illness has no I know territory. It's 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 universal. It's all over right. the world. Right. Well, I'm going to tell you a couple of things. I think you'll find this really interesting. So uh, I'll start here. So your first your first introduction was, well, we went on this blind date, and I told her, "Yep, erase the list. You know, you're fine. Blah blah blah. Right. You're, you're fine, as in you're hot, you're beautiful, etc." I have to tell you something. I did not know this part of the story, but I'm going to tell you something quite interesting, and that is my mother's name is Bibi. And my mother's mm. no longer living, but my mom's name is Bibi. It's her nickname, of course. And um, she met my dad, not on a blind date, but because they were eight years old. That's why it wasn't on a blind date. That would be a little interesting. But um, my my father, on, on their 50th wedding anniversary, before their 50th an- uh, wedding anniversary, I asked my dad to tell me more about their meeting story. Because I have pictures of them going to school dances and things like how did all of that happen that y'all met? And then you're going to these school dances. This was in Florida. Then she moved to New York, but you all got married right out of college. How, how did that happen? So my father said he knocked on um, uh, her grandmother's door. She was at her grandmother's house. She knocked on her grandmother's door. My mother opened the door. My father lays eyes on her and he says, yeah, that's it. That's the woman I'm marrying. And I'm like, at eight? No, come on. That's when people have cooties. That can't be the story. But that's the story. So I, I'm like, maybe you should meet my father. So I think you guys are sharing the cool kind of like how to chat up a woman gene. Um, But uh, the the second thing I think um, that I think is important to talk about is that um, B.B. Moore Campbell uh, for, for many people was not only about just the advocate for mental illness, but it was the face that we needed to see as a black as black folk, because, um, you know, we're showing up in different places where folks are talking about mental health and mental illness and things that the family could do things that the person can do, but they may not look like us, they may not have the vernacular that we have, they may not understand the communities and the struggles we have at the community um, level. And um, that's what, um, for me anyway, Miss Campbell represented. So when 72 hour hold came out, I sent the book to my parents. And I, and I asked, you know, would they, would they give it a read? And they did. They were very interested in learning more about what was happening with me as a person with lived experience. Right. And so they came out to California. They live on the East Coast. They came out to California for a visit. And lo and behold, there was a 72-hour hold reading at um, Pasadena Bookstore of uh, Romans. Right, right. So my, my parents came. Literally, my mother was, as uh, BB was reading, my mother was holding my hand and just squeezing it so tight. And um, I stood up and I remember thanking um, uh, her for writing the book because people like my parents need to see representation. Other families who are going through similar situations, books where you can even read, see yourself in the book. And at the end, the BBs got to meet each other and there's a picture and she signed the book for my mom. So wow. uh, yeah, yeah, it was really quite amazing and powerful. Well, that's a great story. So, um, you know, when we think about representation, we're, we're talking about mental health and mental health advocacy. And how do we, how do you in, uh, think about that at NAMI, Ur- NAMI Urban LA for the Black community in particular? And I know it's Black, Latino, large um, Korean population as well. So how are you all thinking about these things from a cultural context? Well, as you indicated, uh, until 
just affected our family, we had no idea that the national numbers is that one out of every four persons in the United States is either affected by or knows someone that's affected with mental illness. And it became a, a crusade for BB because of the fact that being a minority was one strike already. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, having a mental illness was another strike. So a lot of Black families or minority families do not discuss this. It's, it's just like if you, if you go back to the movie Soul Food, if you, if you remember the uncle that was in the room, he probably had a mental illness, but mm. they kept him hitting it out of sight. And that's kind of like what they do. They talk, oh, we, I've got this crazy uncle, you know, he does this, he does that. So BB's crusade started to erase the stigma. I mean, mental health is, should be on the same plane as physical health. I mean, just like you get a, a checkup with regard to your, your physical health, you should get a checkup, as I say, get a checkup from the neck up. Mm -hmm. and, and I think it's important that mental illness is uh, destigmatized in order for our communities of color to get the help they need and not be ashamed to admit that they have a mental illness. And, I, and, and that's what NAMI Urban Los Angeles is, is geared to. A, I call it the little engine that could. You start off with just a few people. We would do family to family classes and we have support groups. And uh, now we've gotten to the point where we've trained trainers. So we've got a number of people that are able to, you know, provide classes. And we also have now, we have our classes in, in uh, English and in Spanish. Uh -huh. uh, and we're finding more so now that the word had to get out to the Latino community because they are, again, the double stigma, uh, being a minority and having mental illness and they too, and having a proud heritage also. No one wants to admit that they have a problem, but but we've been able to cross that bridge and we've gotten more people involved. And now we're finding out that also the Korean community has the same sorts of problems. So we've reached out to them as well. So that's kind of what we've uh, done. We just want to make, make sure that people are aware of the different resources that's available to them to help them to combat uh, mental illness or to deal with their loved ones that, that do have a mental illness. Yeah. And, and I love the power too of NAMI Urban LA because it's community centric and community centered. Um, the first time I visited the, the office over in the Lamert Park area, it's not just that it's there and kind of you go in the office, you do your thing, you go in the office, you have the meeting, but you know, the other parts of the community are connected to NAMI Urban LA. And I thought that was really powerful because you know, I think of the affiliate, you know, I was a member of two affiliates at the same time because, right. you know, my home affiliate in Pasadena, there are only a couple of people who look like me. Right. And so that's lovely. I can go there and I felt very welcome. I didn't have any, any, any issues, but sometimes it's like, I didn't want to code switch. I just didn't, <laughs> you know, just wanted to be comfortable, say it how I want to say it kind of in the way that I like to say it without kind of code switching. And so I know I could feel at home in Lamert Park and NAMI Urban LA. And there was already work happening, like with uh, was Crystal Stairs, it's right there, you know, with the business district, uh, with the churches, it was, it was not just kind of like things happen in just NAMI Urban LA, which is about, to me, the importance of um, inclusion, belonging, and that's how you reduce stigma is it's not hidden in a corner and you go in that hidden corner, but it's a vital part of the community and um, things that are happening in the community. And also what we've done too is that we've expanded beyond just the physical location in Lambert Park. We actually go classes at, at different churches and, and different community centers and so forth so that we are able to, to reach out to the community where they are. Of course, Lambert Park is... is is central, you know, for the most part, but we, most of Hispanics live on the east side of Los Angeles. So we try to make sure that we, we are all inclusive and, and go to where they are, which makes, makes it much easier for them right. to, to take advantage of the resources that's available. Right. And, um, you know, also the Department of Mental Health and other mental health agencies, seeing the value and the power, I will say, of NAMI Urban LA. Um, one of the other things I recall is when um, one of the contracted agencies reached out to NAMI Urban LA to help them figure out how to start uh, peer-run groups 
in a particular area where they had not done the groups before. They did them at their west side, but they had never done them in the Black community. And so they said, well, we don't want to do it wrong. So let's go to NAMI Urban LA and see how to uh, support standing up and running these peer groups in our contracted agency. And that's how I became even more involved, a little bit more involved with NAMI Urban LA. And um, seeing the power of peer-to-peer -peer for people with lived experience, supporting other people with lived experience, being able to get paid for that work. So you're building economic wealth, helping people move into um, you know, full independence, um, either on or off disability. So there was just so many things to think about when I talk to people about race, race equity, lived experience and mental health, I also put in things around not just that representation matters, but you know, how are we building capacity and, and wealth in our communities as well, because that helps us be healthy. Right. Well, also what we're doing too is that uh, do have a contract with the Department of Mental Health to do that. And I think that's important. Yeah. And you also did the um, homeless outreach program with the other businesses and other community-based organizations within, this was within the Lamert Park area when there was um, so much shifting around and moving, you know, people off a of skid row and suddenly they're showing up in somebody else's community right. and, or sometimes family members might struggle with having a loved one at home but they want to keep the loved one close and the loved one wants to be close. So they would be living out on the streets, like down the street from the family member and the police were coming and doing sweeps. And I remember us saying, Hey, you know, garbage is for sweeping, not people. So we work with the police and we worked with social services. And we also found out like there was concern about, well, don't give them paper. Don't give them resources. They're going to throw them away. And so we asked people, what do you need? And it was like, they wanted those silver blankets. They wanted flashlights. There were certain things that were really important for them that we could print the resources on that then right. became useful to them while they were working towards um, getting those uh, service connections. Well, you know, the other thing that, that NAMI Urban Los Angeles is doing, or NULA, uh, is doing is that we're having sensitivity sessions for police officers as well. Mm. So that I may have a curriculum for them to understand because the solution to dealing with a person with, with a mental illness is not to have someone show up with a gun uh, and, and no training and just not knowing how to deal with, with, with the person. They may be in a, in a crisis mode or whatever, and they're not going to follow your orders. They're not going to do what you say. And uh, we want to make sure that we can uh, sort of tamp down the aggression with regard to the police officer, because typically they, they are the authority when they tell you to do something, you're supposed to do it. And when you don't, it agitates them. And so the key is to make sure that we have uh, sensitivity training for those police officers so that when they go out, they understand what they're dealing with, as opposed to them just going out, dealing with someone that's non-compliant. And of course, you know, what we don't want is for people to get either pistol whip or baton whip or kill, you know, right. because compliant with, with the police officer. And and typically when you do call 911 to report someone having an episode, 99 times out of 100, the police are sent out. Right, right. I think, you know, we're so uh, fortunate that, you know, you're doing that training and that now we have a new easy to remember three digit number soon to be launched. By the time this airs, it would have been launched, I believe, um, which is 988. And so we're, we're also hoping that 988 will um, engender a more appropriate um, personnel response, whether it's mobile crisis, whether it's a, a peer, whether it's connection to resources that really can support the person from a cultural and linguistic sort of lens. I'm, I'm hoping that's what happens so that, you know, police really aren't trained or, you know, they're, they're trained to, to maintain safety, right? <laughs> they're, they're trained to keep people safe and all that kind of stuff. And I, it's, it's not like they're trained to be medical responders. I know they, they do for like heart attack or, or stroke or something like that, but certainly not first responders for that. I'm looking forward to 988 implementation and seeing if that helps yeah. our community. I think that's important because if, if you send out a professional that has been dealing with, uh, persons with mental illness, and they will handle the person totally differently than, than, uh, than the police officer. Plus, the other thing, too, is that when that person goes out, they're unarmed. So therefore, there, there's not any sort of confrontation because, you know, when, when you see a police officer, the first thing they do is that they put their hand on their gun when they approach you. 
And that could trigger a response where if you've got a social worker that understands, you know, what what this person is, is dealing with, then they, they come at them totally differently. And it and it de-escalates the situation as opposed to escalating. And I think that's what police officers do. Not so much that they don't have the training per se, just just the fact that they show up. Yes. You see a police officer that just escalates the situation because they just assume well there's going to be some sort of conflict. Yes, yes. I think it's natural. I tell people, think about when you're driving up your car and you look in the rearview mirror and the police are behind you, what's the first thing you do? You tense up, you start looking around, you look at your speed gauge, look at your like when you know your mirrors, are they all in the right place? Oh my gosh, do you have your seatbelt on? So there's this automatic response that we all kick into naturally. And I think as black folks, I talked about for me, the first time the police had to show up in response to um, a call that like a wellness check. I was not doing that well. And I expected an EMT. That's what I thought. They said, oh, we're calling because you need a medical help. Okay. Why is there a police officer at my door? Um, and, And when it was a police, I, the first thing I thought really that went through my mind, because I didn't really have interactions with the police is I, I thought some, for some reason, back to the civil rights movement And I could see police officers and fire folks with with dogs and spraying people with hoses. And so I really didn't have a positive image in my mind, right? And I think these days people are thinking, you know, George Floyd and so forth. So for Black folks, there's no positive image, but fear. And imagine if you're already in a vulnerable state and not doing well, how fast that can escalate just by the mere presence of seeing a police officer. They, They did a recent study they found that in, in the state of California, Black folks are pulled over six times more than they pull over white folks, but they are less likely to have any contraband or anything. They just get pulled over because they're Black and yeah. not doing anything wrong. And in most cases, they just get pulled over and they find nothing. But because of the fact that they're they're Black, I mean, you're six times more likely to be pulled over because you're Black. Exactly. I think it's such an important conversation that we still have to to have. And I was also going to say something about um, not not to shift the subject, but you know, one of the things that I'm I'm also I'm really really impressed with Nami Urbanelli over the years that sometimes I don't see um, in some of the other affiliates is the participation of fathers brothers, uncles, a lot of times people say NAMI mommies, NAMI mommies, and they think about NAMI as dominated by the mother figure or the sister figure, the female, if you will. And, um, you know, seeing you and and Harold and others involved in NAMI over the years really says something to me about the power of our family and the importance of family, quote unquote, unit, whether it be family by birth, family by choice, but it's, it's that unit that comes together to support the person. Yeah, and I think that's the key, and that that's kind of how the uh, oh, we started the crusade back. Uh, you know, as you're aware, BB passed. It'll be 16 years uh, in November mm-hmm. uh, when she passed in 2006. A group of uh, people from the D.C. area, friends of hers, and her god daughter, felt that because she had been such an advocate in for mental illness, that we need to do something that that would uh, commemorate her. Uh, her tireless efforts in making sure that the stigma gets erased. And it just so happened that one of her friends, uh, a doctor, uh, Dr. Linda Warden Boyd, got involved along with Courtney Lang. And Bibi had gone to the University of Pittsburgh. And it just so happened that one of her classmates, Albert Wynn, was a congressman at the time uh, mm-hmm. in, in Virginia, Fourth District of Virginia. And he was the one that sort of spearheaded the effort to have the month named after her because of her contribution she had made. So it took a couple of years, but in, in April of 2008, we had a, a, a joint revolution of both houses that, that named uh, the month of July as uh, B.B. Moore Campbell National Minority Mental Health Awareness Month. That's how it got started. And, that time, and we have a task force that, that is, it's together today. Uh, you know, today we, we've done two symposiums. Uh, uh, one we just did on the 7th of July, and then of course Nor- uh, NULA or NAMI Urban Los Angeles will be doing its annual tribute to BB on uh, the 24th. We had a group that wanted to change the name of July to, to BIPOC 
let me say, look, we understand that, uh, and of course, BIPOC is uh, of Black, Indigenous people of, of color, but they want to take the month of July and rename it. And it's like, well, look, there are 12 months in the year. Why are you taking the one month that has been named for a pioneering Black woman and change the name? Uh, our mission is to erase the stigma, not her name. Thank you so, so much for saying that. I think well, you've heard me talk about my experience with Miss Campbell and with my family, and it's so etched and ingrained um, in my mind. And, and clearly, those experiences helped me to figure out how I wanted to contribute back, right? And so um, if there was no Nula, <laughs> you know, <laughs> there was no B.B. Moore Campbell, I honestly, I don't know where exactly I would be. I don't know where my family would be. So uh, that's at least from a personal level, how much she means to me as a person, as a uh, role model. Now, I'm not a writer in the same way she's a writer. I wish I was, but, um, you know, it's something that is so critically important. Well, we, we don't erase people's names. We don't do that, especially people of color. Like what, what, what is happening? <laughs> like, um, people of color erasing people of color's names. Like, just think about it for a second. It's like wrong on so many levels. What I will say is I do understand that people are concerned about the word minority, that it feels a particular way. And I 1000% can understand that. We can address the term minority as needed. Why erase the name? And, you know, then if the word minority bothers you, leave that alone and but, but more importantly is is B.B. Moore Campbell's name and preserving B.B. Right. Moore Campbell's name because of everything that she laid the ground. And we don't want to undo that. We want to, um, I'll say, pay homage to that. We want to recognize that. We need to spread the history, legacy information. So I'm so glad we're having this conversation so people can understand, well, who is she? I, I see B.B. Right. Moore Campbell, Minority Mental Health Month, but who is B.B. Moore Campbell? So <laughs> we just told you. <laughs> but, and I think that was the, I won't call it a problem, but issue with regard to, to people who wanted to use BIPOC. Uh, they wanted to change the name, and it was more an era of uh, omission and commission. They had no idea who BB was. Yeah. And when they found out who she was and how she pioneered the awareness of mental health, they said, oh, my goodness, we weren't aware of this, this person and we weren't aware that she had done all of this. And, and we're talking about going back to, you know, the late 1990s when she started her crusade. And so it, it's like, it, it was almost as if the BIPOC group was starting something new. It's like, no, you're not starting anything new. This is something that was started almost 30 years ago. Yeah. And you can't revise history. I, I mean, you, that's why we say we want to erase the stigma, not her name. And, uh, you know, the symposium we had this year that was held on July 7th dealt with black suicide, which is mm. a prevalent issue in, in our community. And being able to give voice you know, to people that are experiencing that and also provide them with resources and, and, and tools to cope with that so that when they feel that way, they won't take their lives. They'll, they'll reach out to someone and get the help they need. That's why it's important. Again, we want to erase the stigma, but not her name. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Erase the stigma, not her name. I couldn't agree with you more. And I hope um, people will continue to explore, read her books, um, look up more information about B.B. Moore Campbell. There's information on the NAMI Urban LA website. There's some information there. There's a video there. So by all means, if you don't know who somebody is, look it up. <laughs> Right. Exactly. Just don't erase the name. <laughs> like, look, right. like the name is there for some reason. You might want to know who is that person. Right. So, uh, let's have a little curiosity quest, and um, you know, be curious, be interested. Exactly. And um, for young folks, I'm going to be honest. Remember, people pave the way. People right. have paved the way. Who are those people? Let's learn about those people, and um, let's all celebrate together the folks who have paved the way. And, you know, even new language that is emerging, but let's not forget the people who paved the way because without them, some of us wouldn't be here. That's for sure. Exactly. So, um, you know, I really want to thank you for joining me on the podcast today. And I really, um, you know, I want to reiterate a, a couple of things. First is, again, sort of to, to thank you, erase the stigma, don't erase her name. And for NAMI Urban LA, 
what an example of all of the different ways in which we can support our um, Black mental health, our Black community, as Black folks supporting other communities of color. I think it's just such a wonderful example. So I want to thank you for your continued work um, in this area and NAMI Urban LA for continuing to support not just the Black community, but all communities that, um, especially underrepresented communities of color that need that support. So thank you so much. You're welcome. And I'd just like to end the conversation with one of Bibi's uh, favorite quotes. It's, ring the bells that still can ring. Forget your perfect offering. There's a crack in everything. That's how the light gets in. And that was written by uh, a Leonard Cohen, but that was yes. our favorite thing. And I think it kind of sums up erasing the stigma, but not her name. Yes. Thank you so much for that last wisdom dropping of her favorite quote. And for our listeners, remember to share this wonderful episode and to join in and listen in next week. Thanks for joining Unapologetically Black Unicorns. Hashtag Black Mental Health.